will now consider two closely related arrhythmias with well-defined underlying pathogenic mechanisms arising in the supraventricular region. Atrial fibrillation is a very common and clinically important arrhythmia. The most striking finding on the ECG in this disorder is that the heart rhythm is irregularly irregular. The distance between R waves varying from beat to beat with no discernible pattern. If we mark out a set of R waves on a piece of paper, moving along the rhythm strip, we find no fixed relationship between episodes of ventricular depolarization. Furthermore, there are no identifiable P waves. These are the characteristic ECG findings in atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation arises secondary to many different disease states, both intrinsic and extrinsic to the heart. In this arrhythmia, multiple sites within the atria, in the example shown here eight, but often many hundreds, are depolarizing randomly and independently of one another. However, the individual depolarization events generated by these sites never manage to completely depolarize the atria as they run into refractory zones generated by earlier discharges from other sites. These relatively small depolarization events are therefore referred to as wavelets. Atrial wavelets produce deflections of variable morphology and these deflections occurring at a rate between 400 and 700 per minute are termed F waves. If we remove the QRS complexes and T waves, we can see that F wave activity results in a continuous chaotic disturbance of the isoelectric line. As P waves are generated by the coordinated spread of depolarization over the atria in a defined period of time from a discrete depolarizing focus, in the presence of atrial fibrillation, P waves are absent. Even if a depolarization wavelet reaches the AV node, it may or may not be transmitted into the ventricles depending on whether the node is permissive or refractory to transmission. Within the AV node, the depolarization wavelet may be blocked in its journey to the ventricles by intranodal refractory foci generated by previous wavelets. As these refractory regions complete repolarization, a depolarization event arriving at the same point, at a slightly different time however, may manage to negotiate its way through the node and discharge into the ventricular conducting system, triggering ventricular depolarization. The net result of these chaotic supraventricular events is a random generation of narrow QRS complexes with no evidence of P wave activity on the ECG. These are the characteristic ECG features of atrial fibrillation. In this example, with 12 OR waves in 30 large squares, the heart rate is 120 beats per minute. Rates between 120 and 140 beats per minute are typical. However, the actual heart rate observed in cases of atrial fibrillation is highly variable. It may be much more rapid than shown here, however, it may occur at a rate within the normal range, or even be slow enough to qualify as a bradycardia. When the heart rate associated with atrial fibrillation is less than 100 beats per minute, it is described as controlled atrial fibrillation. In the absence of treatment, controlled atrial fibrillation is often observed in elderly patients. This is because in this age group, atrial fibrillation is frequently associated with significant underlying heart disease. In this situation, the AV node may be diseased and transmission of atrial depolarization wavelets to the ventricles impaired. As in this example, F waves may be quite prominent. In many cases, as shown here, however, they are of low amplitude with minimal disturbance of the isoelectric line. 
These two situations are sometimes referred to as coarse and fine atrial fibrillation. Coarse atrial fibrillation probably arises when the number of depolarizing sites in the atria is limited to less than 10, and each individual electrical event affects a mass of atrial muscle significant enough to cause a substantial wave on the ECG readout. Fusion of such coarse underlying F waves with T waves and QRS complexes may distort their appearance. Fine atrial fibrillation occurs when the number of atrial sites depolarizing is larger. The multitude of smaller individual wavelets resulting in less net disturbance of the isoelectric line. In reality, a full spectrum between coarse and fine atrial fibrillation is observed in patients and the distinction has no clinical significance at the present time. Atrial fibrillation is associated with a number of preventable complications including stroke and heart failure. You must be able to identify it on the ECG. The key to identifying this arrhythmia is the irregularity of ventricular depolarization and the absence of P waves. We will now study a related arrhythmia generated in the supraventricular region. Atrial flutter arises by a very specific mechanism. In this arrhythmia, a loop of depolarizing activity circulates constantly within the walls of a diseased right atrium, discharging depolarizing current into the left atrium. This is a re-entrant loop and is our first encounter with the phenomenon of re-entry. We will explain exactly what this means in the next videos. However, we need to discuss atrial flutter here as it is closely related in terms of etiology to atrial fibrillation. In fact, it is very common to see patients who flip between these two arrhythmias. In flutter, the rapidly discharging loop of current in the walls of the right atrium rotates anti-clockwise, discharging into the left atrium at approximately 300 discharges per minute. If we mask ventricular electrical activity for the moment, you will see that the discharge of depolarizing current from the re-entrant loop produces a large negative deflection in the inferior leads, illustrated here in lead 2. These are flutter waves. At a rate of 300 discharges per minute, the flutter waves are of course present at intervals of approximately one per large square. This is the sawtooth pattern characteristic of atrial flutter. Identification of elements of this underlying pattern is the key to the diagnosis of this arrhythmia, but it is not always easy. Remember we are looking here at a particularly striking example and with ventricular activity removed. So what effect does this process have on the ventricles? The atria are depolarizing approximately 300 times every minute. If this were transmitted to the ventricles, a ventricular rate of 300 beats per minute would be potentially fatal, as the chambers fail to fill between beats. The AV node protects the ventricles and cardiac output by selectively blocking transmission of a proportion of flutter waves. In the example shown here, the AV node is conducting one in every four flutter waves, giving a ventricular rate of 75 beats per minute. Note how easy it is to make the diagnosis in this case. With this low level of conduction, we can easily identify the flutter waves between episodes of ventricular activity. This is atrial flutter with 4 to 1 conduction. Real problems in diagnosing this arrhythmia arise when higher rates of AV conduction are present. A healthy AV node will typically conduct every second flutter wave, resulting in a regular narrow complex tachycardia of 150 beats per minute. You will appreciate that identification of flutter waves in this situation is much more difficult as the electrical events of ventricular depolarization and repolarization fuse with every second wave, obscuring it and also distorting its shape. The diagnosis may be particularly difficult when, as is often the case, 
the flutter waves are of low amplitude. Yet even here, the pattern can be identified by the practiced eye. This is atrial flutter with two to one conduction. This ECG emphasizes the importance of a high index of suspicion in the diagnosis of atrial flutter. The ECG is taken from a patient with a long history of poorly controlled hypertension who presented with marked hypoxia secondary to bronchopneumonia. We note that his heart is structurally abnormal with clear evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG. We are aware that hypoxia is a potent trigger of arrhythmias in the presence of heart disease. We also note that the tachycardia is monotonously regular with a heart rate of 150 beats per minute. This should immediately alert us to the possibility of underlying atrial flutter. Although no obvious flutter waves are present, examining lead V1, however, we note a deflection consistent with P wave activity preceding the QRS complexes. A repeat ECG with V1 as the rhythm strip shows the deflection to be a consistent feature. These putative P waves are present at intervals of 10 small squares, that is at a rate of 150 per minute. So could this be a sinus tachycardia arising in response to hypoxia? It could be. However, closer analysis of the readout at a point exactly halfway between P waves shows this consistent distortion of the QRS complex. It is of the correct orientation and represents P wave activity fused with the terminal portion of the QRS complex. So atrial depolarization is occurring at a rate of once every large square, that is 300 times per minute. This is atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction. Analysis of this ECG shows how easily one can miss this diagnosis. As a general principle, when faced with a regular tachycardia demonstrating a rate of or close to 150 beats per minute, always examine the ECG closely for flutter waves or any evidence of atrial depolarization occurring at a rate in the region of 200 to 400 times per minute. This ECG also emphasizes the fact that lead 2 is not always the best place to analyze atrial depolarization, highlighting again the value of a full 12 lead ECG in the diagnosis of arrhythmias.